Good evening, church. Uh, it's good to see you. Welcome to our Wednesday night service. I have a quick question. Who's been praying for the heat? <laughs> this Tennessee boy is not ready. <laughs> I walked out of the building about lunchtime today and about melted. Last weekend, we were outside for our spring festival. We had a light misting and it was about 50 degrees. Today, the heat index was in the, the low 90s. Only in Middle Tennessee do you get a 40 degree swing over the course of a couple days. <laughs> I act surprised, I shouldn't be surprised, but I am thankful for <laughs> uh, air conditioning. I really am. I will once again welcome to service tonight. My name is Caleb. I'm a part of the adult ministry team here at the church, and that encompasses uh, pastoral care and adult small groups and assimilation. And it is just a, an honor and a, and a joy to have each and every one of you here tonight. Uh, but I want to pray for our offering tonight, and I want to invite you to join me in that. But tonight I really want to offer a prayer of, of, of praise. You know, last Saturday, again, our outdoor spring festival, Pastor Allen had an invitation for those who, who needed uh, healing. And they stood, and those surrounding them, uh, two or three, would, would, would place their hands on those needing, needing healing, and they would pray for them. And I am here to report that over the Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, tonight, Wednesday, we have received report over report over report of God moving and bringing healings to the life of the individuals in this place and around the globe. We serve an awesome God. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. And so tonight, I really do, I just want to thank him. I want to thank him that he designed our bodies to heal, whether that comes through a procedure or, or medication or, or supernaturally. He is our great physician, and he is worthy of our praise. So if you would, would you please, please stand with me as we pray? And I want to encourage you, if you've received your healing, tell your story. That is your testimony. Be an encouragement to those around you. If you're still waiting on your healing, it's coming. Do not grow weary. Do not grow tired. Do not grow faint. Keep praying. I don't know when it will come or what it will look like, but your healing is on the way because Jesus already paid the price. But let's praise the Lord for his goodness today. Let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do. We come before you with great thanksgiving and praise this day. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image, Father God. Lord, male and female, you created us. And Lord, you did. You designed our bodies to heal. When you knitted us together in our mother's womb, Father, Lord, you knew every little sail. You know every little detail. Lord, you designed us, Father. And Lord, we thank you. And we praise you that, you that we are your image bearers, Father God. But Lord, right now, I want to thank you for what you have done for us. The places of healings where we have seen you come through, where we have seen you move. Lord, may that be a great and mighty testimony that rises up out of this place and goes into the community and throughout the earth to be an encouragement to those that are still waiting for them. There's their healing. Father, send your Holy Spirit to bring strength and endurance peace and comfort and understanding for those that are still waiting. But Father, we know that you still do great and mighty things in the earth. Father, we thank you for doctors. We thank you for modern medicine. We thank you for the instrumentation, for the insight that you have given us as a human race into our bodies. But Lord, at the end of the day, we proclaim that all healing is yours in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. It is by your stripes that we are healed, Father God. Lord, you took on our brokenness. You took on our sickness, our pain, our, inf our affirmities, Father, Lord, that we might be made whole in your Son's image. So, Father, Lord, I do. I pray for healing, for health, for vitality, for life and life abundant, for all of those that need you to come in and do what only you can do. But, Father, we thank you and we praise you for you are good. You are good and you are worthy of our praise. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Don't sit down just yet. Hold on one second. Really quickly, help me out. Let's welcome back Robert Morgan to the stage. Thank you, sir. Wow. After a prayer like that, anybody ought to be able to preach and teach. 
and I'm so happy to be back. I appreciate Pastor Allen inviting me back. He is such a uh, respected man in this church. I, but I've got a suggestion for the um, Muffersboro Planning Committee. We need a 10-lane highway right to this campus. That's what we need. The traffic between, I live near the Opryland Hotel, and it was really bad today. It reminded me of the old couple that went out to Los Angeles, and they got in their hotel, and the old fellow went out to get some donuts, and his wife called him on his cell phone and said, Horace, be very careful. I heard that there is somebody going the wrong way on the freeway. He said, you wouldn't believe it, Mabel. It's not just one. It's hundreds of them. <laughs> well, that's sort of the way I felt today. So next time, I may just come by helicopter. No, it, is, it wasn't that bad, and I'm so happy to be here. I want to speak tonight from the book of Revelation. I've been doing a lot of that because of the release of my book, The 50 Final Events in World History. And there is a pattern to Revelation that I want to show you tonight. I didn't discover this for a long time. And then one day, well, actually one evening, as I was reading through Revelation in the car and explaining it to somebody, I began to see this. I'd never seen it before. And it is the secret code behind the book of Revelation. And that is the point of view shifts from earth to heaven, and back to earth, and back to heaven, and back to earth, and back to heaven, so that all the way through, you can really take a pencil and read through Revelation and mark dividing lines between what is happening on earth and what is happening in heaven, and you are getting heaven's explanation of what's happening on earth. Now, last week I was in the UK, and I was there preaching, but somebody took me to Chatsworth, the stately manor house or stately home that maybe some of you have visited. And in the gardens, they had a maze that has been there for hundreds of years, just big shrubbery, big hedges over a large area. And you go into it, and it twists this way and twists that way, and you get lost, and you come to dead ends. But in the middle of the thing, if you can get there, there is a platform, and when you climb up onto that platform, you can see everything and figure out how to get your way out. Your perspective changes. Well, that's what we've got to do in life. We are down here on this level. Things often don't, don't make sense. We run into um, dead ends. We run into rocky ground. We run into narrow passageways. We have a lot of difficulties in life. But when we look at it from above, things become more clear. And we can see the pathway forward with the wisdom of God. Now, that is the underlying message of the pattern of the book of Revelation. And it's such a wonderful thing that I want to show it to you. We can't trace it all the way through but I want to show you, and then we will make some application. So turn with me to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter number 1. And after the prologue, it begins in verse 9. I, John. Now this is John the Apostle. Now he is about 85 years of age. He was probably 19 or 20 when he began following Jesus as a young man. I believe that John was the sales representative for his family's extensive fishing business up in Galilee. We know from archaeology that the fish from the Sea of Galilee were prized all through the Middle East, and there are places where they, there were factories there for processing them. Sometimes they were dried. Sometimes they were put in vats and transported live. Sometimes they were pickled or other things were done to them, but it was a delicacy. And do you know that in John chapter 18, when Jesus was arrested, 
he was taken into the court of the high priest of Israel, which was at the very top level of political and social strata in Jerusalem, and John was able to go right in. And he went out and he got Peter and brought him in because the high priest and his household knew this 19 or 20-year-old John. How was that? And I think it's because the only explanation I can think of is that John was a very personable young man, brilliant, and a good personality, and good with business, and he was the sales representative for the fishing business up in Galilee, and he sold fish to all of these people in the higher classes in Jerusalem. And then he began following Jesus and became the disciple whom Jesus loved. And after that, after the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, he ended up in Ephesus. The Roman Empire was already separating into east and west. And the east was speaking Greek, and the west was speaking Latin, and the primary church in the west was in Rome. But the primary church for the entire eastern church was Ephesus, and John became the bishop there for many years, and probably he was 80 or 85 years old at the time of this writing, and he was still overseeing the churches in that area. And it says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, where was the island of Patmos? It was on earth. This is an earthly location. It was an island in the Aegean. And John had been banished there by the Roman authorities because he was the last surviving apostle, and his influence was very great, and they wanted to break off that influence without making a martyr out of him, and so they exiled him to this island. What the Roman authorities didn't know was that the Lord was actually behind it, using it as an opportunity to get John's undivided attention to give him the contents of the last book of the Bible. What the devil tries to do, the Lord has a way of turning around and using for his glory. And so he was on the island of Patmos, and on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I have a map in my book, and you'll see that's just in a circle of churches. It's like along a postal code in the Roman Empire, and John was over them. And I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and suddenly, John sees the Lord Jesus Christ, glorified and lifted up. I've talked about this before. You've heard me say this before, but the majestic power and radiance of the glorified Christ in heaven caused John to fall on his face. He hadn't seen this wonderful friend of his for 65 years, and the first words that Jesus said were, don't be afraid. I was dead, but now I'm alive, and alive forevermore. So, he's seeing Jesus in heaven, but now in chapter 2, we're back down on earth to the angel or the messenger of the church of Ephesus right, and we have these seven churches, and the Lord Jesus has given this information to John. John is now going to give it to these seven churches and so, the Lord wants these seven churches who were the original recipients of the contents of Revelation to be as strong as they could be. And so, in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, we have a diagnostic evaluation of every congregation. Now, I've been pastoring the same church for 43 years. I'm no longer senior pastor, but I've been there. And so, I read about Ephesus, and then what Jesus says about Smyrna, what He says about the church in Pergamum, about what He says about the church in Thyatira, 
in chapter 3, the church in Sardis, in chapter 4, Philadelphia, in chapter Laodicea, in chapter 3, at the end, the church in Laodicea. And I say, which of these seven churches is my church most like? And the answer is, all of them. We all have strengths, and we all have weaknesses. And one day I'm going to preach a sermon through these seven churches. I'm sure that Pastor Allen has done that. Pastor Jackson has done that. But every one of these churches have strengths and weaknesses to them. So when we read these two chapters, we are able to evaluate our own churches and our own individual lives and say, well, look, I am persevering. I am working hard. I have good doctrine, but I've grown a little lukewarm. Or my first love has died down, and we are able to evaluate ourselves and say, Lord, I need to be as strong as possible if I am to receive and understand and pass on to others the content of revelation about the last days and the future you have for this planet. So help me as I read chapters 2 and 3 to take these words to heart. So that's why those two chapters are there, and all of these churches are down on earth. But now look at chapter 4. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And I heard the voice that I'd first heard speaking to me like a trumpet. And it said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and a ruby. Now, Jasper in this particular context would have been a stone that sparkled like a diamond. And he describes here the throne of God. This is a particular interest to me. I've gone through the Bible to try to find every description that I can of the throne of God that is suspended up in heaven above us that is literally there, that literally is inhabited by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I say literal because Jesus rose from the dead in a literal body, and so He's got to be in a literal place. And this diamond-like throne with its radiating, emanating glory and radiance everywhere is so dazzling, so sparkling, so surrounded by the cherubim so surrounded by the angels, worship is taking place here, and John is overwhelmed. And that's chapters 4 and 5. And then we get to chapter 6. After this, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals, referring to the scroll. I'll not get into this, but there is a scroll here with the last battle plan for the world from God, And it's sealed with seven seals. And the Lord begins to open these. And I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown. And he rode out as a conqueror, been on conquest. And then the second seal and the third seal. I'm not going to take time to describe what these are. I just want you to notice that it's describing things that are taking place at the beginning of the tribulation on earth. So you see here in Revelation how we go from earth to a scene in heaven, back to earth, back to heaven, and now we're back down on earth for the tribulation period. But look at chapter 7 and verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they're praising the Lord, and John is back up in heaven. He sees what's going on in heaven again, and he comes to understand what heaven is saying and how heaven is reacting to these things happening down on the earth. And then we come to chapter 8 and verse number 6. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down on the earth. And now we have another set of disasters after the seven seals. 
and these are called the seven trumpets. And all of these various disasters are intended to drive people to Jesus and to judge evil. Now, all through this, heaven is rejoicing. You say, why is heaven rejoicing while judgment and catastrophes are happening on earth because evil is being dealt with, and it's going to be dealt with once and for all, and the way is being cleared for Christ to come again. So, heaven is looking at all of this differently, and down on earth, it's pretty rough up in heaven. Now, it goes all the way through the book like this. I don't want to take time to go through all 22 chapters, but let's turn over to the end. Look at chapter 18 and verse 21. 18 and verse 21. And now we are in the empire of the Antichrist, which is referred to as Babylon. Now, if I've lost you with Revelation, then I have a a book that I could suggest to you. But the sequence of events just takes you through the tribulation period, and now we're at the end of the tribulation period, and it says in 18 and verse 21, then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw them into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down. So here we are back on earth with the destruction of the capital city of the person whom Paul called the man of lawlessness. But now we come to chapter 19, and we're caught back up to heaven. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah. And again it says, Hallelujah. And again it says, Hallelujah. And again it says, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, over and over again, as the angels are erupting into praise that has never been heard before and may never be heard again because the time has come for Christ to return to earth. And his return is described in this chapter. Verse 11 said, Then I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like burning fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself, and he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And it goes on to say that his name that is written on his robe is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And heaven then comes down to earth in the form of Jesus Christ. He sets up his kingdom. And then in the last two chapters, we're back in heaven, but this time to stay. It is the new heavens, the new earth, and the city of New Jerusalem, and the last two chapters give us the most vivid, glorious description of how the children of God through Christ are going to be spending eternity that you can find anywhere in the Bible. So, that is a very brief review, not of the contents of Revelation, but of the pattern. Now, I don't know how many of you here You know, I grew up in East Tennessee, Northeast Tennessee. I grew up in a town called Elizabethton and in Roan Mountain. And we were fans of the University of Tennessee. And the whole of East Tennessee is painted orange. And when I was a boy even, and I remember my dad owned an apple orchard. And during harvest season, which is in the fall, they would play the UT games from the radio over the loudspeakers so that we wouldn't miss anything. And there has never been anybody like John Ward. I don't know if you've ever, you've never listened to him do a play-by-play. How how many of you have? Well, about half of you. He was a wonderful play-by-play announcer. And, um, And he had a color, Bill Anderson was his color commentator or his analyst. 
And John was very, very dramatic. You know, he, would, he tried to paint pictures. He had a wonderful voice. And so it would be something like, we'd be listening to the radio, and it would say something like, long pass down field, caught at the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5, to the 4, wrestling to the 3, going on to the second, and give him six touchdowns. And if you were watching on television, the guy had made a touchdown 30 seconds before. But John was just drawing out the play-by-play for the excitement of it. Then Bill Anderson would say, now, what happened, John, was, and here is why they did that play, and here is what's going to happen next, and he would analyze it from his booth up in the sky. That's what you have with Revelation. You have the play-by-play of what's happening down on earth during the tribulation period, but it's interspersed at every point with the commentary from heaven. Now, the reason is we need to understand what is happening on earth from the perspective of heaven or we will be lost in the maze. Not only in the maze of Revelation, But there's a broader lesson here. We've got to learn, if we're going to get through the difficulties of life, we have to learn to look at things below from the vantage point of God above. Now, that's the lesson that is woven in to the pattern with which the book of Revelation is taught. There are flashpoints on earth. It might be a war in Ukraine, might be a pandemic, might be a car crash, might be a doctor's appointment, but we can't deal with these flashpoints unless we have the viewpoint of God, looking at life from His perspective. So how then do we do that? I've got four suggestions for you. Here's the first one. If you are discouraged that's an indicator. Discouragement is an indicator. Maybe you aren't looking at your situation from God's perspective. Now, it's taken me a long time to learn this, and I haven't perfectly learned it because I still get discouraged. I am learning not to stay discouraged. And it's impossible not occasionally to be disappointed or discouraged by something But if we remain in a state of discouragement, it's because we are not looking at things from God's perspective, because He knows what He's doing, and He's going to guide us, and He's going to reroute us, and He's going to bring good out of bad, and beauty out of ashes, and blessings out of curses, and even when things happen that you don't like, or you don't want, or it isn't what you had aspired to, The Lord is in control of all of that, and He can use it absolutely for the best. When I was in the UK, I had supper with a man named Neil Bourne, B-O-R-B-O-U-R-N-E, and he told me his story. He was a Christian who was a very successful business leader in London, in Westminster. He said, when I started my work, I was hired by a man. And the company had a lot of potential, and I thought my career would just take off. But this man had addictive issues, and he kept messing up the company and making bad decisions, and he wasn't reliable. And I would take him my suggestions. I knew what we should do. I had ideas that I knew would grow the company, and I'd give them to him, and he would fumble them. And I went home every single night and told my wife, this is a nightmare. This job is awful. He's ruining the company, and my career is going down with the company. But then he said, because of the man's addictive issues, he died prematurely. And because he had run the company so bad, the stock was very low. The company was undervalued. And Neil said, I was able to pull together the financing because the stock was so low to buy the company, and then I could implement my own policies. (laughs) And he said, through the years, the company has thrived and grown, and now I understand 
why, if it hadn't been for all of those days when I went home so discouraged and so dejected, I would never have later been able to buy this company. The Lord had a plan. He knew what He was doing. That's true for everything in the life that is committed to the Lord. You give something to the Lord. It might be a burden or a problem or an opportunity or a potential, but you give it to the Lord and He knows what to do with it. He knows better than we do. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. So, if you're discouraged, the Bible says, do not be discouraged. Just look that up. It says it many times. I, th- I counted once. I think it's about 45 times. The Bible says, do not be discouraged. There is never a time when it says, be discouraged. Not one. It says, do not be discouraged. The only way we can do that is walking by faith and trusting in the promises of God. So, if you are discouraged, take it as a clue that maybe you're not looking at your situation from God's perspective. It would be like reading all of the earth passages of Revelation and never reading heaven's commentary along the way. Here's the second thing. Commit whatever grieves you into the hands of Him who never leaves you. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? I think apart from the Bible, that is one of the greatest phrases that has ever been written. It comes from, a, from the English translation of a hymn, a German hymn by the Berlin pietistic hymn writer Paul Gerhardt. And I love this hymn so much that when, we, when they came to me with my book, The Red Sea Rules, and said, we're going to reissue it, do you want to make any changes? I said, I want to make sure this poem is at the end of the book. And so they put it in there. It comes from the 1700s. But it says, commit whatever grieves thee into the gracious hands of him who never leaves thee, whom heaven and earth commands, who charts the clouds their courses, whom winds and waves obey. He will direct thy footsteps and make for thee a way. So, whatever it is that is grieving you, all of these tribulations on earth. Commit them to the Lord. That takes practice. At least it has for me. I've had to learn to do it. But the Bible says to cast all your cares on Him. It doesn't say cast some of them. It doesn't say cast all of them except this one. It says cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. Psalm 55, 22 says, cast your burden upon the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be moved. So, trust in the Lord. Commit whatever grieves thee into the hands of Him who never leaves thee. And thirdly, begin filling your heart, your mind, with thoughts from heaven. Because we've got to learn to think differently. Down here are all of these earthlings and they're running around looking at things horizontally just from the perspective of people who are like going around in the maze, lost and running into dead ends. We've got to learn to climb up on that pedestal, open our Bible, and see things from God's perspective. Now, there's a wonderful passage about this. It is Isaiah chapter 55. It says, and this is the Lord speaking, My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts, your thoughts. In other words, I don't think the way you do. I think very differently than you do. You're thinking down here. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so my ways are above your ways, and my thoughts, your thoughts. You say, well, if that's true, how can we ever learn to think like God? Well, the verse goes on to say, as the rain comes down from heaven and the snow, 
and returns not thither, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth food for the eater and bread for the sower. So my word is that comes from my mouth, it will not return unto me void. Now think of the way the Lord waters the earth. What if he said, oh, Middle Tennessee needs some rain, and he just had a big vat and he poured out 10 billion gallons of water all at once. He does it in one little drop at a time. And it waters the earth, and he gave us his word. It didn't just come plumping like that. It came one word at a time, one verse at a time, one chapter at a time, one book at a time, until we have in our hands here the collection that represents the very thoughts of the mind of Almighty God. And so when we begin to study the Bible every day, then it enables us to increasingly develop his perspective. It's impossible to read your Bible and study your Bible every day with an open heart without gaining wisdom. And wisdom is looking at life from God's point of view. It's a very old definition. Wisdom is looking at life from God's point of view. So as we meditate on Scripture, then that Scripture is remolding our mind. What does it say in Romans chapter 12? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And as your mind is conditioned by Scripture, you begin increasingly looking at things from the perspective of eternity. And this is what Colossians chapter 3 says. It says, since you have been raised with Christ, set your minds on things above. Not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ. And set your hearts on things above, not on earthly things. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is excellent and worthy, whatever is praiseworthy, think on these things. What we do with our minds is the most important thing about us because our behavior, our perspective, our attitude, our emotions, everything comes out of our minds. And if our minds are conditioned by the Scripture, then we are developing the mind of Christ and we will increasingly look at things from God's perspective. This is why we need to keep open Bibles around the house. Don't ever be very far from an open Bible. Have it on your desk, on your table, on your bookcase, wherever it is, and make sure every day you are absorbing some Scripture. Just in the morning, open up to whatever passage you want to study, and take a pencil and mark it all up and Say, Lord, what do you want me to learn here? And the next day, pick up where you left off the day before and become a consistent personal student of Bible study. You don't have to be a great scholar to do it, but as you do that day by day and as you find verses you want to memorize and as you learn to meditate on it, you're developing the mind of Christ. And then number four, watch then and see what God will do. Now, do you see the progression here? Look at, look at your life, every, every area of your life. Are you disappointed? Are you discouraged somehow? We'll say, yes, I am discouraged in this area. Maybe I'm not looking at this from God's perspective. So then you take it and you commit it to Him and you resolve to study His Word every day so that you're thoughts can be expanded to his dimension of thinking, and then you wait to see what God will do. I've got an example of this that I'll share with you. There was a lady, a writer named Robin Lee Shope, and she was 20-something, not married. All of her siblings were married. Their mother was still alive, but the older lady became frail and needed a caregiver. And Robin Lee said, I'm not married. I'll move in with mom and take care of her. And she moved in with her mother, and for several years, that was her full-time 
task, really, was taking care of her mother and cooking for her and helping her with her household duties, and at night they would read the Bible together. And when her mother passed away, Robin was just devastated because not only had she lost her dear mother and her companion, but she had essentially lost her purpose in life because that's what she had put herself into, and she was heartbroken. And when the time came for the funeral, she was sitting alone on the front seat. Her siblings and all of their families were all around her, but she happened to be alone on that front seat. And the casket was in front of her, and she was just weeping and sobbing and feeling so sorry for herself. And during the funeral, she heard the back door open of the church and footsteps coming down the aisle, and a young man sat down beside her that she had never seen before. And as they gave the eulogy and they gave the sermon, he was weeping and just felt so heartbroken, and she was curious, who is this young man? And the funeral proceeded, and finally he looked over at her and whispered and said, why do they keep calling her Margaret? And Robin Lee said, because that's her name. And the funeral went on a little bit longer, and the young man looked over and whispered again. He said, I don't know why they keep calling her Margaret. And Robin said, that's her name. He said, no, her name is Mary, Mary Jones. Robin says, that's not whose funeral this is. He said, isn't this the Methodist church? She said, no, that church is across the street. You're at the wrong funeral. And then the worst thing that could possibly happen happened. They both got the giggles on the front row, and they covered their face with their hands and pretended to be sobbing, but they just couldn't stop giggling. And after the funeral was over, they met in the parking lot. He said, well, I've missed my aunt's funeral. He said, would you like to have a cup of coffee? And she said, I might as well. And one year later, they were married in the little country church where he served as an associate pastor. And when people asked them, how did you meet? He says, her mother, Margaret, and my Aunt Mary introduced us, and it was a match made in heaven. (laughs) Now, how does God do that? I don't even know. How does he take the saddest day of your life and somehow make it one of the most meaningful moments of your existence. I don't know how he does that. But that is the message of the book of Revelation. It's true that during the tribulation there's going to be judgments on earth, but in heaven they're looking at it very differently than we do because they know that it's all leading to the final judgment against evil and to the eternal life that Jesus has for his children for whom he is quickly coming again. And so we look at things. We learn. It's a process. Paul said, I have learned to be content. But we learn to begin to interpret life, to climb up to the center point and look down. And instead of amaze, we see Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And we know that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Now, this is a message for those who know Him, who have received Him as your Savior. What if you haven't? Last week in the UK, I had a very long taxi ride back to the airport. And my taxi driver was very talkative. And he told me, he said, my father was blind, 
but he became a great musician. And as a young man, he enrolled me in the choir, and he said, I've been singing in choirs for many years. I drive a taxi to pay the bills, but my greatest love is singing in churches and cathedrals with the choirs. And I said, what kind of music do you sing? He said, I love the great hymns of the Christian faith. And I said, well, one of my favorite is, Praise ye the Lord the Almighty, the King of creation. And he sang it for me. And then I said, well, when did you come to know the Lord as your Savior? He said, well, I'm really not what you would call a Christian. I said, how could that be? He said, well, he said, I've just never made that decision. And I just thought, what do I say to this? And I said, it must be a very sad thing to sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me when you've never been saved. It's one thing to have the songs. It's another to have the Savior. I hope that he took that to heart. And I hope that you are too. It could be there's someone here and you're familiar with church and you know some of the songs, but you've never really given your life to Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you to go beyond the songs to the Savior and beyond the music to the Master. And the final invitation of the Bible in Revelation chapter 22 says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who is thirsty come, and whoever will, let them come and take of the water of life freely. If you're watching online or if you're here in this room, You can do that tonight. You can pray and confess your sins. And as best you know how, receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And if you're watching online, there'll be some way there, if you'll watch your screen, for you to communicate back here so that we can get some help to you. And if you're here in this room, there'll be pastors here at the front. They would be glad to pray with you after the service. You can say, I am just lost in the maze of of life, but I need the perspective of the Savior. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who gave up His only Son for us all, how will He not also freely give us all things? Who can bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is He who condemns? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, and who rose again, and who is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor angels, nor any other creature can ever separate me from the love of God which is in our Lord Jesus Christ. So make sure you know him and begin looking at life from the perspective of Almighty God above. Will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our Almighty God and Father, if someone here should need Jesus, Lord, may they tonight not tomorrow or next week, because, Father, we don't know about life. Open their hearts, resist Him no more, and come to saving faith. And, Lord, if there are those who need to be lifted up to the pedestal, where they can open Your Word and look down with Your wisdom, then give them a real heart for the Scripture. Lord, give us a hunger for Your Word. And will you stand with me as I say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and with yours both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. And you're dismissed.